sense of kind of coming into the depth of it or the light and being a bit um, disconcerted, disoriented, confused. Um, it's pretty much how the spiritual journey goes. You go through these periods where you're exposed to a lot of things rapidly sometimes and then the mind kind of spins around and, and the ego tries to adapt a bit. And um, there was one section in the text of A Course in Miracles called The Healed Relationships, quite a famous text. It's in those nine chapters on going from special relationships to holy relationships, chapters 15 to 24. And where Jesus says, he's talking about inviting the Holy Spirit into the relationship. And he says the Holy Spirit comes immediately after the invitation is offered. But it's very disconcerting and very difficult to the ego when a new purpose is given to a relationship. Because a relationship was formed out of unholy purposes. That's what the world was made in hatred. So all interpersonal relationships start with attractions and codependencies and needs and all kinds of baggage from the past. And that's the unholy purpose for relationships, which is specialness. Then when you invite the Holy Spirit and it, it can actually be disjunctive. And it can be in a group setting like this, or it can be in a relationship where you're drawn to somebody and all of a sudden the prayer of your heart is, Holy Spirit, come into my relationship and help me. And um, it can be so disjunctive that the so much resistance comes up, the mind wants to just, the ego wants to break off the relationship immediately um, because it doesn't suit the new goal. It's almost like the ego wants to go back to the old goal, <coughs> but the Holy Spirit's already been invited in and no chance of that. And then Jesus has his line in there, it would not be kinder to shift the goal more slowly. In other words, there's going to be a spin in the mind when you go from upside down thinking to right side up thinking, from wrong mindedness to right mindedness. There's naturally going to be a spin. <coughs> a drug addict that goes through detox, you don't think there's a spin if you've been a heroin addict for 10 years and then you, you come clean and go dry, and or an alcoholic or a cocaine addict or whatever, you know there's a detox spin. And you might say it's the same detox spin in relationships. When you have had an unholy purpose for the relationship, it's very horizontal. And suddenly a vertical beam of light is introduced, which is inviting the Holy Spirit. It's going to be disjunctive. It's going to spin. We've all been through it. You know, we, we shouldn't even be so shocked <laughs> by it. You know, we're calling upon healing. And we've been addicted to linear time. So what would you expect? Uh, it's going to be a bit disorienting, but it's nothing to be shaken up about. Um, and I, I was, Jason was just saying that there's some in the group that were like, whoa, it's, it's really a bit confusing and disorienting. And I know it was for me at the beginning too, and, and then after a while you start to go, well, I, I have called on the healing, and I, I guess I'm in it, no matter what it takes, and I'm just going to go for it. And it's got to be for the good. It's like if you go underwater and you go deep down in deep sea diving, and if you come to the surface too fast, you, you could get the bends. Uh, you, it, the air pressure thing is not good. To come from such pressure uh, up to the surface where there's no pressure. And it's the same with the spiritual journey. If you've been under intense repression and denial, and intense pressure, when you start to come to the surface, you know, it's going to be disorienting like it is when you're a deep sea diver, but, but you don't want to come up too fast, or it can be really disorienting, like dangerously disorienting. And so that, that's a little bit of a context for this whole awakening, is that you're calling on the healing, and, and in one sense you, you start to get a little bit a little bit used to it. You never get completely used to the disorientation, but, but it's just good to remind yourself this is just temporary. 
this too shall pass. It's not a permanent condition. We get flushed out of our comfort zones, but it's really what we want, actually, because these have been ego comfort zones, and they're like ego death zones. <coughs> with artificial, instead of artificial intelligence, artificial comfort. And who wants to go through life with a bunch of artificial comforts when there's no joy, and there's no peace in that? It's just like, it's the comforts of defense mechanisms. You know, they minimize fear. They were designed by the ego to minimize fear without letting it go. You've got to remember the last part of that sentence. Defense mechanisms were made by the ego to minimize fear. Sounds pretty good at the start. Without letting it go. So really, to minimize fear and keep it. That's what the ego is using these defense mechanisms for. That's why projection offers, oh, a little bit of comfort. Get it off your chest. Blast them. Tell them how you feel. Tell them your truth. I always like that stuff. Your truth. Your truth. How many truths are there? What's this your truth stuff? Be vulnerable. Let it out. Rip it. Let it rip. Blast them. Give it to them. Calm down. Uh, you know, this projection stuff is not actually going to bring you any comfort. It's actually like firing a laser beam into a mirror. Uh, and it's going to zap you eventually because the whole idea of projection is to try to get rid of something that you do not want. But it's how you actually keep it. You keep it by projecting. You blame, you feel guilty, and you keep the guilt. And you blame again, you feel guilty, you keep the guilt. The projections never work. They, they're actually terrible devices for getting rid of guilt. It's the worst thing you can do. <laughs> you want to get rid of guilt is, is project it. <laughs> it's like, it's stick here to you, you know, it's like, get off. <laughs> and it's just not going anywhere, it's just going to stay, and stay, and stay, and stay. So, so, I would just say, as a summary from what uh, Jason's group was talking about this morning, is that, yeah, there's going to be disorientation, but, but just, Go with it, in the sense that, just remind yourself it won't stay, and, and you remember, you're turning your mind from upside down to right side up. It's like, uh, well, Titanic's not a good example, because <laughs> The Poseidon Adventure. Anybody seen the Poseidon Adventure? There was the first Poseidon Adventure, then there was the second Poseidon Adventure. There are movies. The first one had the theme song from Maureen McGovern. There's got to be a morning after, if we can hold on through the night, we have a chance to find the sunshine. Let's keep on looking for the light. You know, it's come through the darkness. But the whole ship is capsized. Ships are not designed to be in the water upside down. <laughs> So, it's very dark in the Poseidon Adventure, and they're trapped in the darkness. Mm -hmm. Sounds like uh, planet Earth, trapped in the darkness. And they've got to go up toward the light, which is, they've got to go, everything's upside down. So they, their, their journey is, you know, they, they're trying to get toward the air pocket, and toward the light, and towards freedom, which the, the chandeliers and the lights are all on the floor, and the doorways in these high rooms are way up in the corner. There's no ladders either. It's a tough journey. You've got to find your way to get up to the doorways, which are way at, up on what seems to be the ceiling, because everything is upside down. And that's what you're doing when you're navigating the spiritual journey. Everything is upside down. It's all capsized. And now you've got to go for the right-mindedness, which is why everything in this world is backwards and upside down. So, you cannot judge your advances from your retreats. You cannot even judge your successes from your failures. If you're so confused in this state of mind that you don't know the difference between pain and joy, which Francis and I did a talk on recently, and Jesus says that in the Course, you cannot tell the difference in this state between pain and joy, then you really have to realize, honestly, that you don't know your own best interest. 
And once you start to open up to that, you can start to have a context for how clueless that you really are. And this goes a little bit into what Kirsten's group was about, was about, and, and Francis, I remember saying in her group, it was about trust because there's not the structure uh, on this awakening journey that, that the ego has imposed lots of structure to minimize the chaos and you're going into more of a trusting, non-structured, guided way of living. More spontaneous actually, and less structured because the ego has imposed heavy structure to try to minimize the chaos and now the Holy Spirit is turning it around. So, so trust was the topic that came up in Francis's group and and we talked about that the other day. It's not so much trust in people, but it's just developing a trust in your intuition and in the spirit that's there for you all the time. You're always getting your instructions and your guidances, but when there's a lot of fear and resistance in the mind, then the ego doesn't want you to hear that those instructions and those guidances. It wants to show, throw in heavy interference patterns so that you won't hear the voice for God and, and take the journey up and out. So... Oh, okay, so those interference patterns. Yeah. Like the what? Interference patterns. Interference patterns. Yeah, those, those are like these floods of, of streams of doubt thoughts from the past. Because the ego is terrified of the Holy Spirit, is terrified of the awakening, is terrified of the whole direction of healing. Because it's a death wish, and it's terrified of anything that resembles healing or light. If you have loving experiences, the ego will go from suspicious to vicious. It absolutely hammers the mind when you start to have loving experiences. Because it's almost like, whoa, 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 you're not escaping here. Almost like, like having a little mouse trapped, and the mouse starts to find the way out, and it just puts the foot down on the tail. Oh no. <laughs> I've had you for a millennium and you're not getting out so quick. You know, it's, it's very strong. It doesn't want you escaping from time and space. So, so that's where, at times when, when the lesson comes in, be vigilant for God and His Kingdom, you, you really have to just remind yourself, okay, I'm not going to bite, I'm not going to bite on that. The way I always did it was, I'm not going to conclude anything. Attack thoughts, these guilt thoughts, are hammering the mind, hoping the mind will just give in and go into a cycle of depression, and eventually beyond depression into suicide, because that's that's what a death wish does. It, it, that's what it wants. It wishes for death. So depression is just a, a sending the mind towards the death wish, towards. But death, of course, we talked about is no escape, but it's just that the ego. It's just promoting its thought system, which what a death wish promotes thoughts of death and sickness, pain, suffering. So the trust has to build and has to grow, and that's also why you you may feel like it's it's quite strange. Like some of the guidances the ego will judge as weird. It'll just say, that's ridiculous. You know, I had times where I would receive a guidance to call somebody, go see them. That's ridiculous. You haven't talked to them in years. Don't be foolish. Let them make the first move. You're not calling them. You know, it's, it just is going to be very defended against these beautiful miracle impulses that can really free your mind, where you can be truly helpful and open your heart. So you have to just be aware that the ego is going to to come in with a strong enough way. Let's see. And then, what's, was there anything else in here? Victimhood. Victimhood. Being very strong. My will is speaking to my will. Yeah. This is not my will. It's Jason mentioned to me <coughs> too, it was this thing of, of things seeming to happen and then the, the judgment of being this is not my will. This is not what I want. Um, this is definitely going the wrong way, and so on and so forth. These kind of judgments can just come up. 
And it's helpful to remember the context in the early part of the workbook where Jesus says, in no situation do you perceive your own best interest. He doesn't say in some or in most. He says in no. It seems, and the ego just objects and goes, oh come on, I've at least had a long life. There's got to be some situations where I saw my own best interest. There's got to be some. But the reason in no situation do you perceive your own best interest is that the Holy Spirit doesn't know what situational thinking is. Situations are part of Newtonian linear timeline. Even thinking that you're in a room listening to David Hoffmeister give a talk, you know, in downtown Aarhus, and say, now that's a situation. Yeah, that's trying to pull out of the entire quantum field a, a little tiny little speck and give it a name, and give it a label, and really you're all of it. You're everything the whole cosmos is in you, and you're everything, so when you try to shreve, squeeze anything down to a specific situation, then that's a problem. You're trying to limit, it's almost like you're using a, a tiny percentage of your brain, we'll say, like in uh, What to Believe For, what's the latest movie? Lucy. Uh, some of you might have seen Lucy. You're just using like 10% 10, 10 of your brain, and you're not really perceiving all the cosmos as it really is. You're just perceiving a very small fraction of what is based on your beliefs. And so you're limiting your whole perception, you're putting the blinders on, and then thinking you actually know what's going on with that 10%. And that's why in no situation do you perceive your own best interest. Because actually you'll go deeper, you realize there aren't even situations. It's situational thinking is the problem. We're, we've been actually convinced and hoodwinked into believing that there are different situations. And there aren't even different situations. It's all one unified field. And yet the mind thinks, oh, this, and then I go to this, and the next one, and another. And then it breaks the world and the, all of life into situations, and then it tries to solve the situations. When there aren't even situations. You know, some of you might have seen What the Bleak Do We Know, the quantum physics movie. And then the second one, Down the Rabbit Hole, that they did the extension. And in that point, there's a physicist in there who, who's, who's describing the questions that most people ask, the practical everyday questions ask, <coughs> is like asking, what is the marital status of the number five? <coughs> most everyday questions. That we ask, like, what's for dinner? <laughs> when will you pick me up? Where will you meet me? Can you stop and bring home some wine, a bottle of wine on the way home from work? <laughs> All of the everyday questions that are part of the human conditions, as I've said before, are much ado about nothing. But those questions are like asking the question, what is the marital status of number five? It's not that their questions are wrong. It's just that they're impossible questions. Marital. 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 Marriage. What is the marital status? Your marital status. Single or married? Single or married? That makes no sense. Okay, that's, that's from the movie. I'll try another one. What is the pregnancy status of the number five? If you can't get the first one. What's the pregnancy status? Of the number five. Wow. Is, five, five is five <laughs> pregnant or not? It's just an either or. This is marital status. Is not. I know there's a lot of variations now. But I came from an era when we had married or single. Now it's complicated. <laughs> They've got a whole category on Facebook. <laughs> you know, it's, it's a lot of. <laughs> but, but, but you see how ridiculous the question is. Because people will say, well, the number five doesn't have a marital status and certainly doesn't have a pregnancy status. Numbers aren't pregnant or not pregnant. But what, when we, we don't realize that with all these fake situations in this make-believe world that we've put up, that these questions that we think are really good everyday questions, we think we're having a real conversation and, you know, and the angels are laughing all the time. All the time they're laughing. Because it's crazy. They're, 
questions don't have any meaning. And then the deeper you go and you have these deep mystical experiences, then you end up laughing too at, my God, everything is so funny because what you thought was so serious, so very serious, wasn't serious at all. It wasn't even real, but, you know, it, it can't be serious if it's not real. And that's the whole point of nothing real can be threatened, nothing unreal exists, herein lies the peace of God. The first night we talked, a lot of people said they wanted peace of mind, but you have to come to that distinction that nothing real can be threatened, nothing unreal exists, herein lies the peace of God. That's the summary of A Course in Miracles, that's the, the, the three-liner uh, conclusion, or, or summary of A Course in Miracles. That's the cliff notes. Some of you are not in the course, you don't, that's fine, doesn't have to be your pet, just remember. Nothing real can be threatened. Nothing unreal exists. Here lies the peace of God. Another topic that Jason told me came up was, I guess with Lisa and Bill's recent uh, Copenhagen thing, it's just choose. Choose love. Choose love. Come on. Choose, choose, choose. Use your power of choice. Choose love. Well, the only thing about that is, is if you believe in the ego, and that's a horrific idea, that's the belief you can separate from God. That's so terrifying and so horrific that that's why it's been pushed out of awareness. If you go and you interview people on the streets, and you walk to the streets of Aarhus and you stop people on their bikes and cars, and you say, I have just one survey question for you. Did you separate from God? <laughs> You're not going to get a hundred percent yes on that. Because why? Because it's not in conscious awareness. So most people would say, no, I like, I like God. Or maybe you say, let's not use the word God because it's kind of charged over here. Uh, let's use the word spirit. You know, are, did you separate from spirit or whatever it is? Uh, no, I like spirit. Or, or try the angels, that's even a softer <laughs> word. Did you separate from the angels? <laughs> no, they're with me all, they're with me all the time. They're all around. Can't you see them? They're all here. <laughs> Aarhus is a hip town. I'm sure there's lots of people that have angels with them all the time. They're not going to say no. And so, when we say choose love, your choice is coming from your, your desire. But if you have an unconscious belief system that you're not aware of, here's an interesting line from A Course in Miracles. Jesus says, a decision is a conclusion based on everything that you believe. A decision. You want to choose love? Well, look at this. A decision is a conclusion based on everything that you believe. So, if you believe anything at all that's of the ego belief system, your surface life will say, as a human being, is more like a robot acting out unconscious beliefs. Do you think you have free will? Not in this world you don't. Do you think the Course teaches you you have free will? Yes, in the clarification of terms it does say you have free will in heaven. He, God created you with free will, which is perfect happiness. It's another synonym for free will, but not in time. Jesus actually says in his Course that you are guilty in time and innocent in eternity. So all this affirming about innocence, I'm innocent, I'm innocent, I'm innocent, I'm, I'm an innocent human being. <laughs> no, 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 no. You are guilty in time, innocent in eternity. So we really have to be quite honest about uncovering these unconscious beliefs and bringing them up. Because if the decision is a conclusion based on everything you believe, then your decisions as you go through this world, as kind of like a robot in the ego system, you're like a clone. The body, the personality is like a clone. Could be foreshadowing a movie. Yeah, I think so. Like the body, the personality self is like a clone, and it has no free will of its own. It's simply acting out the unconscious belief system. And so are all the other bodies. And so is Mother Nature. And so is the world. We, we see movies like uh, 
Lion King. We all we like Lion King with all the animals. It's all just like an exciting adventure. Then the circle of life. You know, all the animals are all different colors, pretty colors, and they're swaying. No, go back and watch Marlon Perkins' uh, Animal Kingdom. Watch every animal eating every other animal. That's all he did was go around Africa and, these, and, and film all the eating that was taking place on the planet. Cannibalism. It, it just everything eating something else. That's not in the Lion King. It's just it's you gotta you gotta give yourself a full picture. You know they're all the circle of life. You know, it's, it's Simba. You know it's, it's so no. It's, the world was made in hate. We're, we're probably two minutes away from a slaughterhouse. If I open the windows up, uh, and you're all singing Circle of Life. The cow is getting, no, no, no. Take the blinders off. There's no free will in this world. And so, isn't that good to know? Wouldn't you want that straight from, the, from your divine source helping you wake up? In fact, I mentioned that the other day in um, in the movie The Matrix, when Neo first comes to Morpheus, and and Morpheus is talking to him, and Neo is asking, "What is the truth?" The first thing that Morpheus says to Neo is not that he is the one. The first thing that he tells Neo is that you are a slave. That's how he starts it out. That's how the teacher works with the pupil. You are a slave. A slave of something that you cannot see or smell or taste or touch. You're in a prison for your mind. He's telling him, you are stuck in a prison, in an egoic prison. And you, he doesn't even begin telling him he's the one. He has, that has to come much later through discovery and, and literally revelation. It has to be revealed. He, he has transcendence over all the images, and he sees them all green and energy at the end, but that's not how it starts. So really what we're looking at here is, when we say choose love, the Course has got 31 chapters, 365 lessons, a manual for teachers, and a clarification of terms, and most of it, as, as our brother Ken Wapnick brought out, most of it's pretty dark. Most of the Course is really talking about what you haven't looked at, what you have to face. Because the body's like a robot on the surface, just acting out these unconscious beliefs. So, so it, it is important to choose love, and you do have to cultivate the power of your choice. You have to bring back to your mind the power of choice. And that's even a workbook lesson, 152, the power of decision is my own. You have to be empowered to start to realize how powerful your mind is and how powerful your choice is and that everything you perceive is a result of your mind, a result of choice. And that's why you're not a victim. There's no accidents, there's no happenstance, there's no, oh, that's unfortunate, or I was unlucky today, or oh, I got a bad draw, or it's a bad break, or all those kind of things have nothing to do with reality. That's just kind of superstitious thinking. So, yeah, I would say in the end, it's so important to choose, choose love, and that's what I call the atonement. That's, that is your choice to freedom. That's choosing the correction for the distorted perception of linear time. And not only is that possible, but that's inevitable. And I would say that as I teach and I work with people, that's my whole mission, is, is joining in the acceptance of this atonement. I really have no other purpose for the world. Just choosing the correction and experiencing the innocence that comes from that correction. And I did hear, um, Brian was telling me too, that, it's, that, and Jason told me from yesterday, that when you, you know, there's these haunting feelings that come in the human condition about, you know, wow, I didn't, I didn't tell the truth with this, or I didn't pay back the money, or I had an affair, or I, I left somebody, I abandoned them, I rejected somebody, 
where I was rejected, I was abandoned. There's these dark feelings that are in the mind, and those dark feelings are always coming from the belief in the reality of the body and the, the reality of behavior. So imagine, let's just pick something more extreme. Imagine somebody who, in the world of time, is a mass murderer. We could, we could pick Hitler, we could pick, we could just pick your everyday run-of-the-mill mass murderer. Maybe they haven't exterminated millions or whatever, but they've wiped out 25, and buried them, and hid them. And, and they have the sense of guilt. They've taken lives, they've murdered. And there's a judgment going on around the behavior that they actually believe they've killed. Although at Lucy we learn nobody ever dies anyway. <laughs> it's just a misperception. Even that the cows nearby are going into the slaughterhouse and that there's killing going on a matter of meters from this place where we are now. That's a misperception. Because, again, when we think we've done things wrong, <coughs> or we think we've not done things that we should have done, that's where the guilt's coming in. But you see, the guilt is projected to the behaviors. The guilt is attributed to these behaviors, wrongdoings. And I'll tell you right now, it's an ontological guilt. The only guilt in the mind is, is the choice or the perspective of wrong-mindedness. You can actually choose again you can be trained to see everything with the Holy Spirit through the miracle, and it won't matter what the form was. It won't matter what the form was, because the form was a misperception, and the guilt is attributed to a misperception. So, I think that that's practical. That's what Brian was saying. Those things come up when you do these healing seminars and healing workshops, then you can notice there's still these haunting ideas that something was done wrong, or something could have been different, could have been better. And what we were joining in the car is that it's an amazing perspective that everything has always been working together for the good, and you just didn't know it. <laughs> yeah, and that self, that, that, you know, that, that self that is identified with with the era, you know, with, with these <coughs> beliefs in the mind that I have done something wrong that I need to now correct, that is tr still trying to solve the problem at the level of the problem. You know, even the expression that questions come up a lot, you know, do I have to say these exact words to this certain person that I have this grievance with? Well, that self that believes that they have done something wrong or that they have the grievance that self is what needs to be forgiven. So taking the action from the place of the identification of guilt, it's not, it's not going to work. It's the forgiveness in the mind that's getting over that identification with, and that misperception over is where the innocence is experienced. And then if the guidance from the spirit comes, yes, say these words. It's coming from a source that is true, rather than you know, trying to solve the problem within, within the mind. In the book, is, Jesus says, what you do comes from what you think. So, it is with your thoughts that we must work. You see how important it is when Jesus says it's mind training, he's really not joking. He's really saying, oh, yeah, you do need mind training. You're, you have a lot of attack thoughts in your mind. Your mind's upside down, and we're going to have to flip it around to where it's, it's bathed in light, and you think only the thoughts with God. That's a big turnaround. Yeah, I think um, someone mentioned in my group, which is a really good point, like what is the difference <coughs> of of coming here and just watching some of the YouTube clips back home. And I, I want to say that the reason is everything is so orchestrated by the Spirit. The fact that you're coming here and everything that is happening 
And every thought that you have is an actual opportunity to see what is underneath and to actually release them. It's not a hypothetical situation anymore. It's not that you sit there watching a YouTube and you go back and dig what could be there uh, sitting in the unconscious mind. Now everything is coming up and you're an active participant in a way that you don't sit back and just inactively watch and then think, oh, I don't have to be part of that because there's some intensity. But actually, there is an involvement and it's all happened for you, actually, just for you. And all the things that's coming up, perceptions, guilt, suddenly all these situ little scenarios that's happening, it's all actually to, to help because of the call and because the spirit is behind all of it. So that's, that's what I really want to say, that you are somehow a very big part of this and things are happening not by accident. And, and the, the awakening, as I was saying earlier, doesn't have to be long and drawn out, but how many of you were able to see that movie, Inception? It was a very good movie because it's the first time I've seen a movie that was using the metaphor of dreaming and, and architects and building worlds and building environments, but it actually brought in the, the concept of the layers of dreaming, like layer upon layer upon layer, like five, six, seven layers. And that the whole amnesia of forgetting love and light and God is, is a defense against that love is, is dreaming. And then the best way to really guard against that light from the ego's perspective is to forget that you're dreaming. In other words, to have defense mechanisms and then forget that you made them up. And forget that it's all a dream. So it's the opposite of lucid dreaming, where you're completely aware that you're dreaming. The first major obstacle, really, that you're going to have to uncover in your mind as you approach the light, is that you've got to come closer and closer to seeing that you're the dreamer of the dream. You've got to come closer to lucid dreaming. You have to come closer to awareness of dreaming of just seeing that the world is not an actual, objective world that's outside of you, that has a physical reality, but that it's actually a dream. And then, the more you're aware that you're the dreamer of the dream, you may even seem to have more control over some bits and pieces. Like, people tell me they love their flying dreams, because they don't get to do it much during the day, these kind of dreams, so they go, into their, and they like to fly, because it's a symbol of more freedom. Oh, I was flying all over the place, and David, you were with me, and we were flying together, and they tell me all their flying dreams, because it's, it's, a, it's a symbol of more freedom. I was, actually, I went to bed the other night, maybe two or three nights ago, and for the first time I was staying at Celia's house over in the, what do they call it, the add-on room? Annex. <laughs> the annex. I was over in the annex. There's no water, or there was no uh, running water or liquid or anything. And I'm, I was dreaming, and I was like, I was dreaming, dreaming, and in my dream I said, oh, I'm thirsty. <laughs> and I thought, but this room has no, no liquids or anything. And then and I'm, in my dream I'm thinking, but it's my dream. I said, it can if, it, if I want it to have, you know, and so, I was there, and I was dreaming, and I was thirsty, and I said, oh, no, and I said, no, I've been through the whole room, and there's no, there's no uh, liquid in there, and everything, and then I said, no, there has to be, no, I, I want there to be, I want there to be, so I went over, and I, I, I was dark, and I let my hand go, and this, and this, and, and it was a can of Sprite, and, and I was like, ah, there it is, I knew it. <laughs> it was cold. Didn't want to go out in my shorts in the rain, and you know, it just. But it's it's just a symbol of oh no, this is a dream. This is a dream. You know, it's it loosens your mind from thinking that it's just like you're stuck. You're stuck in some kind of situation or some kind of thing where you don't have what you need. Isn't that a common ego tactic? Oh, my life would be so much better if I had this or I had that. 
or I wasn't stuck in this job, or I wasn't stuck in this relationship, or if I had a relationship <laughs> in my dreams. Where are you, dream partner? I know you're out there. You know, it's, it's this thing like, all would be wonderful if something was different in the dream. But if you've forgotten that you're dreaming, and now you think you're a dream figure, just at the mercy of a massive world, a massive cosmos, that seems outside of you, that's where you get into this feeling of feeling like a victim. That's when you feel helpless. So you see how practical this healing is, and how practical this Course in Miracles is, is it's telling you, you're not going to wake up from the dream that you're not even aware that you're dreaming. You have to first work towards forgiveness, and all that forgiveness will show you actually is that you are the dreamer of the world's dreams. That's what Jesus says in there. You are the dreamer of the world of dreams. No other cause does it have, or ever will. Isn't that great to know what the big lesson is? The only lesson that there is to get in this whole world is one thing, that you are the dreamer of the dream. And why is that so important? Because Jesus says, you can't change the purpose for the dream until you are aware that you're dreaming it. Isn't that important? When the world was made in hate, do you want to continue on believing that you're just a figure in a dream that was made in hate? That's going to be a lot of victimization, that's going to be a lot of mistreatment. But if you can get back in your mind far enough by just clearing your unconscious mind and doing your forgiveness lessons, and you can see that you're the dreamer of the dream, here comes the Holy Spirit, new purpose, happy dream time, fun, joy, love, laughter, new purpose. The Holy Spirit has a new purpose for the world, but you can't accept it as long as you deny that you're the dreamer. You can't accept it as a person. I can't say, okay, I'm David. I, I'm David. I want a happy dream. <laughs> Give David a happy dream, the Holy Spirit says. David is, David's just a figure in a dream. David's not going to ever have a happy dream. Your mind can, and you see you're dreaming it, but David's not going to ever have a happy dream. You see how that works? You can't. How could you be a figure in a dream that's not even real and be happy <laughs> when the whole dream was made out of hatred? Every fabric in that dream is, is hatred. You know, on some roads you travel gaily for a while before the darkness of fear enters, you know. But we all know, we've been, we've had enough experience with planet Earth. We know. We know. It's dark. <laughs> we know. And there's got to be another way. We know. We know that. That's been, for me, the whole focus. That's why I was forgiving. That's why I was letting go of all these beliefs, emptying my mind. To learn this course requires willingness to question every value that you hold. Not one can be kept hidden, or it will obscure your learning. It will keep you from seeing you're the dreamer of the dream. One belief in your mind, just one, can keep you from seeing you're the dreamer. Can keep you in hell, instead of taking you back to heaven. Just one unquestioned assumption, one, one belief. That's what the layers in, in Inception are all about. Remember, in, for those of you who saw Inception, they need a kick. They need to design a kick, so that they all feel the kick at the same time. We all wake up together. There's not one of us waking up while the other seven billion stay stuck. There's only one of us, actually, so when we wake up, there can only be one of us waking up. It's not done piecemeal. This isn't the hundredth monkey kind of thing. Oh, we've got six billion, seven hundred and eighty-five thousand, Jesus. Are we close enough to, no. Is it all, it just takes one, and, it, and that one is you. Seeing that you're the dreamer of the dream. It's not you as a person. You're not going to wake up that way. So it's really deep, but we've got some great movies this week, and we've got some amazing tools to help you work.
work with this because it's that deep, you know, it's that that much of a mesmer that it's part of it all. Yeah, because if you if you value one aspect of the stream, you value the whole thing. So if there's one part of it that you like to hold on to, you're saying, really, this is not a dream. This is my reality. There's something real about this that I want. And if you want a little part of it, it brings the whole world with it. You don't get to pick and choose. It's either real or it's not. It's either a dream, which means it's, it's not a value to hold on to, and your dream is an illusion or it's real. So to question every value that we hold is to be saying, is to be willing. That is choosing love. Like, if you don't know what love is, you can't choose it. And a self that's forgotten God has forgotten love. So that self can't really choose love and say, I want, I know what love is and I choose it. And Because that self is still believing in a dream. That self, the only way to open up to love is through forgiveness. Because forgiveness is forgiving this identification. It is loosening the mind from holding on to aspects of the dream that it's identified with. And in that forgiveness, in the bringing the illusions to the light, the willingness to, to see the identification of what we think we need, what we think we want, what we think we value, as we relieve ourselves from these beliefs, then we're allowing the truth into our awareness. We're actually allowing the love to come, the innocence to come back into our awareness. So it is a path of bringing the darkness to the light, not bringing the truth into the illusions. And that's just one of the core teachings of A Course in Miracles. And and really what the core is behind every everything that we're constantly sharing because we're worthy of the truth. We're, we're worthy of being with God. And God is obscured by the desire for something else. When you want something other than God, you can't know God. It's total. God is total love. And to know thyself is to know I am one with God. It's a full acceptance of the atonement can't be partial. We can't want two things. So we have to keep seeing what we think we want and seeing what we think we know. Even spiritually, I know how to forgive. I know what to do. You know, I know what I want. It's, it's in that heart opening of, of the prayer. It's recognizing where there's an experience of upset or where we think there's something that we want. And through through bringing it to the light with this prayer for help, we're actually opening our mind up to receive. To receive. Yeah, I, I, in all these travels for the last quarter of a century and meeting all these, these Course in Miracles and so many wonderful brothers and sisters all over the world, I got this feeling in my heart as I was traveling around stronger, stronger, that every one of you, everyone that I was meeting, that we were like lifelong companions on this amazing journey. You know, like every one of you is my partner, every one of you is my beloved, every one of you, this is it, out of, out of everything. We've been called to wake up, we've been called to come together, we've been called to hold hands, so to speak, to join minds, to say, there's nothing that can come between us. You know, you are all to me my mighty companions. And and we have this welcome in our heart when we crisscross, we see, it doesn't matter whether we're traveling or welcoming people wherever we seem to be, there's a rejoicing. Like there's a coming together. It's really in our hearts. It's really not in the form. But the welcome is there. The welcome is so, so, so strong. And why is that important? Why do we need a sense of, of nurturing? Why do we need a sense of companionship? Why do we need a sense like we can look each other in the eye and trust each other? Because we've got the same purpose. We're getting our wake-up call. <laughs> this is our lifetime to wake up. 
not the dilly dally, not to linger <laughs> the time. We're not the dilly dally group. This isn't the dilly dally support group. This is the wake up support group. And the other thing I always appreciated was Jesus. I remember when I was reading the Course, I was like, I was praying and opening the book and getting all these answers. But I was saying to Jesus, I was praying to him, give it to me straight. Give it to me straight. I can handle it. It's like Pat Benatar's song. It's like singing to the Holy Spirit. Hit me with your best shot. Come on! Hit me with your best. You've got to be able to say that to the Holy Spirit. Hit me with your best shot. Fire away. You know. And because what? Because you want the ego undone, don't you? You want you you don't want to try to molly coddle a death wish in your mind. It's like having a virus in your body going. I'll put on a pink hat, maybe that'll help. It could. But the thing about it is, you, wouldn't you want the virus out? If you've got, you know, if you believe it's in, you know, what I'm saying is, is, let's take the red pill together, you know, in the matrix analogy. Let's, let's align and say, yeah, we're going for the awakening. Because, I always said to Jesus, just give it to me straight. Just give it to me straight. I'll, I'll work with you. I'm going to be willing. I'll do whatever it takes. But please just give it to me straight. Don't sugarcoat it for me. And then I remember I opened the course up one day and I was going through and I was, I was in the manual for teachers and it was, the, it was the characteristics of the teachers of God. Some of you have seen it. The ten characteristics. The first one is trust, and then he's got a whole section in there on the stages of the development of trust. And this is the stages you will probably go through. So I looked at it and I see there's six stages there. So I look at the six to see how many are happy, 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 and how, mon how much of them are down. Four of the six. Four of the six. Two thirds of the stages that you'll go through in the spiritual awakening. Difficult, challenging, perplexing, disorienting, hard. He throws, he's got different words in there, but I mean he's telling you, oh, that's telling me straight. I want it straight. I want to know if, if I have to go through the darkness to the light and four of the six are like that, then that tells me I shouldn't be so depressed if I hit one of those buzz songs. You know, I should go, oh here's one of the, here's one of the four. <laughs> the last one is. Great, you know, you've got to, well, that's one, you're on the verge, you know, of total transfer of, of training, but you have to go through it. One time, my, my friend Suzanne Sullivan, she said, <coughs> could, you, could you summarize spiritual awakening? Could you summarize the spiritual journey? I said, yes. It's damn, 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 <laughs> damn, ah. <laughs> Give it to me straight. Would you rather have it straight? Or do you want it dressed up with, with ribbons and, you know, that's the straight talk. But the good news is, what I was saying is, we are mighty companions to each other. We cannot be stopped. Our awakening to who we are is inevitable. So why would we delay in this? And, and like the story in the Bible, you know, if you were told there's a treasure in a field, and, and would you, would you be willing to sell all that you have to go to get this treasure in the field? That's really what Jesus is saying. It's like, here's the atonement, it's your treasure, it's your escape from all time and space. Now, are you ready to go for it? He says, are you ready to help me save the world? Which is really just accepting your own part in forgiveness. That's how you help. Not with going around and wearing long robes and hair and standing in the streets of Harmus going, forgive, and you shall be forgiven. It's not that. It's just accepting your own part in your mind, you know, your own innocence. And it's really important. I mean, I can't tell you how important it is. It's really, there's really nothing in this world that's important. Everything pales, so to speak, in comparison to atonement. And, and once you get into the, the joy of it, you know, if you just get a taste of the joy of it, you will never look, you will never go wandering in the dark again, just searching for some scraps of ego comfort.
to you know hold on until you die that's just a pathetic way to live actually it's pathetic <laughs> survival and, and get some pleasures and, and some comforts and then you die why would we why would we go for something so low it's so low it's just so beneath us really as the Christ it's, it's actually really beneath us it's, it's pathetic so it's like let's let's see that we can rise up out of our chains because they're self-made chains you know the ego we gave power to this ego to try to fool us and convince us that we're tiny and little and we will never be content with with littleness we will never be content with oh just can I have a little more <laughs> a little thimble can I, today can I have a little a little happiness Jesus said throw it away Get your bucket out. Get your bathtub out. And start filling up your big tubs <coughs> with love and joy. And take that thimble away. Don't bring that thimble to me. You ask for far too little. You're entitled to miracles. Oh, I want a pension. I want, I want a boyfriend. I want a girlfriend. I want children and a family. I want to live in a nice house. A mansion. You know, it's like... Throw the, th the thimbles away, you know. What profiteth a man if he gain the whole world and lose his soul? Think of the ones like Mussolini and Hitler. Think of Napoleon, the little guy from France. <laughs> he was on his horse. He was going to try to take over all of Europe. I once, once, one time I was doing a gathering uh, I was doing a gathering, I was in Waterloo, and I had to climb this big monument all the way up. It's like, <laughs> We're blowing the lid off. That chair is not capable of holding you. <laughs> that chair cannot hold you back. <laughs> Cannot hold your back. Yeah. <laughs> I was going up Waterloo, and I was climbing this Waterloo Memorial, you know, and they were, and they have a museum there. And my friend Anna from Sweden was with me, and I get so playful. I got into the museum, and they were showing. They had Napoleon on his with his, his you know, his dress, all dressed up, and this little guy on his horse, and everything. And I, I always love history; it's so funny to me. European history. I'm over here now in Waterloo and I go up and I, I could see crop circles from Waterloo and I really huffed and puffed to get up. And I, but when I was in the museum, I was with her and I said, now here, here's what this little guy from France decided he was going to take over the world. He got all the way up to this point in Belgium. And then this English general and this Russian general they stopped him. So that so he wouldn't get to Sweden. So you know, that's where she's from. So you could be safe. <laughs> Snuffed him out. It's just fun to retell the whole history because all of history is just the same belief that you can separate from God just played out over and over and over again. <laughs> Millions of variations. And and then it's all subjective. So whether you like history or you think history is terrible or you think it's hostile, you think it's wonderful, or whatever, it's all subjective. It's just the meaning you get to it. Wouldn't that have been great if you went to your history class and the history teacher, instead of drawing the timeline and all those different events, just said, listen, it's all subjective. <coughs> it's all subjective. You get an A and whatever you think history is, is what it is. <laughs> but it's subjective. It's not the truth. Wouldn't that have been wonderful. Then you, we'd all be feeling that enlightenment. And that's what we're saying here. Don't, don't even get caught up in what you believe is your personal history. Your stories. What you did wrong. All the stuff you've got to carry around. That you know, that you, the things that you should have done that you didn't, or things that you sh shouldn't have done that you did. And all those different kind of things. You don't really have to carry that weight and baggage because history
history itself is a misperception. Time is not linear. Time is not linear, it's simultaneous. It's right here, right now. Yeah, okay. I'm gonna try to do should I do something? Okay, I'm gonna try to um, formulate my question, but there's something coming up a lot, you know, like when I when I hear you talk, I really resonate. I can hear the truth of it. And then when we when it gets into this daily kind of yeah, these uh, situations that I perceive, you know, it's still, it's still, yeah, it, it confuses me. Um, like, yeah, there's still practical stuff, and, um, and then I, I think how it is in your mind, like how, uh, yeah, like you seem to deal with practical stuff still. I don't know really if you do, but it seems to me you still, yeah. So I just get confused, like, how is it in David's mind? Um, and then it's like, okay, he's in my mind, really. But anyways, I just try to really <laughs> get a hold of this practical thing going on while I'm, uh, I'm not, yeah, while it's really eternal, right? Hmm. Okay. It's beautiful that you're just, let's share the same mind. Let's agree to do that. Because I was talking about this <coughs> the other day, that, that even if it seems like there's details of logistics, what if it was like Trinity in the Matrix? You know that scene kind of near the end of the Matrix when can you fly a such and such and such helicopter? And then, not yet, but it just takes her just a moment. It's like a, a download, and then she can. So she must have had the potential in her mind to fly that helicopter. And we really have the potential to do anything but, you know, it's like, if, if God is with me, who can be against me? If It cannot be difficult. Jesus said, it cannot be difficult to do the task that Christ appointed you to do, because it is He who does it. I love that. I was just like, first time I read that, I'm like, oh my God. I was so concerned about what I'm going to have to do, and how am I going to handle all this stuff, and how am I going to survive? How am I going to live in this world? It cannot be difficult to do the task that Christ appointed you to do, because it is He who does it. You see, we're back to that involuntary nature of miracles. Miracles are involuntary and should not be under conscious control. That's the fun of it. And you can feel the joy of it, even if it's like you need to get a flat tire repaired, or you need to go and get some food, or you need to change a diaper, or you need to get some money from a bank for somebody who's asking for, for money, or whatever. Uh, I mean, it's so practical. And, and what's so great about it is nothing is off limits. You know, that's what we try to say in these gatherings. Ask. Don't be afraid to ask. Don't be afraid to speak it up. Don't be afraid, you know, don't hold on to a sense of, oh, I couldn't, I shouldn't. No, that's not. I need to be able to handle this on my own and everything. Uh, there was one time when Francis and I were in China and Francis was having fun rolling her eyes because I've been traveling around the world, you know, for many, many years and I've been, had thousands of questions asked of me and she would roll her eyes occasionally and just go, only in China. Like, I would get asked a question that she'd never heard asked all those years, with all those YouTubes and audios and this and this. I was in a, doing a group in China, and uh, this woman, um, what's her, what was her name? Suzy, was it Kate? It wasn't Kate Jane, it was, it was D, DJ. This woman DJ <laughs> over there, she's like, I'm feeling lack, I'm feeling scarcity, da 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 da. She, she comes to me and she says, I really feel like I have this sense of scarcity that's always with me. It's just really intense, and there's a lot of tense guilt in there. I need abundance, I need abundance and everything. So she's, she's in the group and we're waiting to hear the question. So she says, so she, can you give me some money? <laughs> and Francis is with me. All the years, all the questions. China. Only in China. Do they ask, can I have some money? <laughs> At a gathering. <laughs> it's like going to Muji in the middle of Sansa. Can I have some money, Muji? <laughs> Jesus, you got a few coins? <laughs> so, the funny thing was, 
I said, I'll pray. So eventually, in the hotel lobby or anything, she's like for the next afternoon or whatever, she finds me, she sees me, and so she says, could you have this guy to tell, give us some money? It, I never know what's going to happen. It's not my money anyway. It's whatever the guidance is. I got about a week ago, she wrote to me again. She wants millions. <laughs> she said, <laughs> she must have the same thing as those kids do. Was, what do they call the currency over there? The yen. Yeah. Yen, yeah. I forget how many million she said. I would, I would like <laughs> David to <laughs> suggest it. Because I think I'll, I don't know how many, so many million yen. You know, this will really be helpful <laughs> in my life. It's fun. It's fun. Don't hold back. Don't hold back anything. And, and also, the practicalities are met. I don't know. I've been praying, but I haven't been received any guidance to send wire millions <laughs> of yen. But, but the fun part of it is, we can, nothing, there's no harm in asking, because as we open up to the Spirit, we can be playful, we can, we can relax, we can, we can ask our questions, we can ask for what we feel we need, we can ask for what's helpful. There's a playfulness with it. And, and what I'm hearing and telling you is that, that the fun for me is that it's just, everything is given. Everything is given. So you don't have to spend all this time figuring it out. Can I speak to the mic? Yes. <laughs> figuring it out and working it out. Then there's Kim. There's a whole group there. And then oh, okay. <laughs> So all I'm saying is, is while you believe in time, and while you believe you need to plan, and while you believe there's things you must do, then of course don't feel guilty about any of that. But know that you're being taken higher and higher <coughs> to a place where it's inevitable that you'll see that everything is your mind and everything's given. But be, be practical. Don't deny the things that you really feel strong about. If you really feel to do something, you know, if you really feel to take action on something, you feel a strong feeling, you know, again, the guidance of the Spirit is helping you unwind from the world. And, and this body has done many things, and many things have come to and from it over these years. And I just like to be in the moment of being grateful for the whole thing, just grateful for the way that it's played out, without trying to analyze it, or, you know, I think that's the part that gets really difficult when we try to analyze it and figure it out, or just keep judging that we, we're not enough, we're doing something wrong. I just have a So it's like your experience is that you, you know as a kid, like you know, it's not like a kid, so it's just that you experience it all. Not even the dream of. <laughs> yeah, it's just being aware that it's a dream. So, so you don't interpret anything in a fearful way. When you have an identification with being a body and a person, that's that's fearful. Like when I go down to third world countries, like when I went down to Colombia, uh, the first time I visited Colombia, they took me out into the rural areas, and I was going to be staying with these husband and wife and some kids, but they had armed gunmen at the airport when I landed, with search dogs and armed, there's lots of guns, guns everywhere. And then, like, you have bikes here in Aarhus, bikes everywhere? This was guns everywhere. So I'm down, I've got guns everywhere around me, and then when I go out to stay with my friends, then there's like a little post, like, where there's gunmen, with big guns, guarding place where I'm going to be staying. But I'm waiting. See, they're dream figures to me. I like to have fun with gunmen. <laughs> you know, I like wave at gunmen. Or sometimes you go to some of these places, like changing of the guard, and they're all in their, they're very serious guards. But I find very happy guards, in my opinion. But it's because I'm aware that I'm dreaming. You see, I'm not, I don't have a, I don't have a connotation with guns, or bikes. Bikes and guns are the same. They're just dream symbols. But you see, it's, that's the difference. It's, it's through emptying your mind. You know how 
Buddha, Jesus, Muji, they all tell you, empty your mind. When you empty your mind of these interpretations and judgments, then it's like they're dream symbols. And they're the same, you know, and you're the dreamer of it. So you can, you, it's actually a, a very playful experience. So you're not telling yourself, okay, it's a dream. It's like you know, you experience it's a dream. Right? It's a difference, right? Yeah. Like, okay. It's not an affirmation. <laughs> no. While you're talking and I'm like, I'm screaming. <laughs> no. So I don't have to like, it's not like an affirmation. Yeah, it's just, it becomes a stronger and stronger experience. I don't think, I don't, I don't feel like it, it's necessary. As we zoom in to this experience together that goes beyond like and dislike, beyond Facebook, <laughs> uh, this and this, you don't have to give your dad this or this, or any other finger gestures. <laughs> you, you know, it's, we're coming into a place where, where I think you can just start to realize more and more that that it it wasn't so much that what he seemed to do was thumbs up or thumbs down, and that it actually needed to be spoken. But it's more and more this a feeling like if if this whole world is acting out of beliefs, then I had this feeling with my biological father at one point because I had grievances with him, and at one point it dawned on me that. He did the best that he could do based on what he believed. And I did the best that I could do based on what I believed. But we were actually always doing our best. Always our best based on what we believed. In fact, that's how it had to work out because he believed certain things about, about what a son should be, what a son should do, what a son should achieve to have meaning and importance and everything. And I had beliefs about what a father should be, and how a father should nurture, and how a father should communicate, and this and this and this. And the actions, the way we interacted, it got a little testy <laughs> at frequently, but it was all based on these beliefs. So one day, my biological father came to me and he just, he had this look of sadness in his eye. And he just looked at me and he looked me right in the eye and he said, Dave, I haven't been a very good father. And what came out of me was nonsense. <laughs> That's nonsense. We just, just rose up. I said to him, you did the best that you could do as a father. I did the best that I could do as a son. And we don't have to think that way anymore. We don't have to lock down into these roles. You should have been there for me. You should have done more. You should have helped me. You shouldn't have yelled at me. You shouldn't have screamed. All those things that I projected onto him, all those things he projected onto me. I said, it's done. We don't have to think like that anymore. It's nonsense. And you know, it was amazing how our relationship changed after that. We were like buddies. We became buddies. We never were buddies, but we became buddies. When I took him off the hook, then I took myself off the hook too. And we both lit up. And all the way from that point until he passed, passed from this earth, you know, it, it had a light feel to it. We were like, we were like happy buddies together. There was even one point when he was gonna, they were, he had, had been diagnosed with um, bipolar and he, I don't know, he, family was upset with him, and so on and so forth, and he was sitting next to me after we had this freeing experience, and we were side by side, he said, he looked at me and he said, you know, they want to lock me up, they want to institutionalize me, they want to put me back in the institution, and they want to give me drugs and everything. And I just smiled and looked at him with just innocence, and he went, yeah, <laughs> even that w couldn't stop me from the feeling I'm having. He totally was empowered, even if he was given drugs and institutionalized. He had this look in his eye like, they can't take the love away from me. Nothing, it was this moment of invulnerability. He said, he just smiled, he said, 
It's gonna, they're gonna do what they're gonna do. He just resigned thinking that somehow the world would control his state of mind. And we could just sit there and relax and chuckle. We had a chuckle. None of us, we didn't know what would happen, but we could, we could just chuckle together. We could laugh together. So I, yeah, I don't really feel like it's this thing that, that has to be spoken to his face. It's more, you just have to see, you did the best that you could and so did he. Take yourself off the hook. Take him off the hook. There's really no point in hanging people on hooks, you know, and, and these hooks of expectations, you know, it's, it's just heavy. It's just, it's just no fun at all. Yeah, I mean, it did start with, with him saying that he didn't think he was a very good father. Um, it, well, that was his expression. And it just was, I was in a state of mind where I just felt so much love just well up inside of me. That's why I said that's nonsense. But, but yeah, it's, it's okay. It's just that I think we come to a point where we start to realize it's, the Spirit's going to do it through us. You know, we're not, we're not trapped. Okay. Ocean's waited patiently <laughs> with this. Yeah, because you have to uh, take me down to some basic, um, because I'm kind of really new to this. I heard about the Bible, I heard about Jesus, and I like the figure, and I like, I, 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 I know some things you're talking about. But um, I'm questioning what is going to happen when we or Jesus is going to wake up, and what is God and Jesus going to do when they're going to get bored? I mean, what is the whole concept? I mean, this is kind of perfect. We have so much love here to give. And, and we're talking about uh, another illusion, uh, another world, or what? I'm just very confused. Because mm -hmm. it's like a dream in a dream, and then you have to really focus on what we believe, and then it's, everything is all right because Jesus is doing it for us. So I really get confused now. <laughs> yeah. So please uh, give me some direction. Yeah, it's, it's this thing that seems like in this world, everything is, is an event, it's a happening, it's occurrence, there's all these people, there's all these actions, there's all these things that happen, and there's all these judgments. It's, that's just the human condition. And it seems like Jesus is just like a symbol of one of us, so to speak, of the human condition, that found out that this really wasn't our home. You know, he just discovered that this isn't it. That, and, and I think for most of us, um, we've had a hunch about that. Like, there must, be, there must be something more. We don't know what it is, but we think there's something more than this. So maybe we just hope there is. I hope there's something more than this. So, he did a lot of teaching in the Bible about the Kingdom of Heaven, and and it's not of this world, and we're being called out of this world, and, and very much speaking about this heavenly kingdom. But it's not a, it's not a place, and it's not a location, and it's not even in time. It's, it's eternal. But there's that word eternal. We don't even know what that is in this world. You know, nothing's eternal. We, we study the cosmos, we see that the stars, these beautiful stars, most of them we see have, have already burned out. We're just seeing light that seems to be coming to our eyes from long ago. Yeah, but, but the nature is so beautiful. What, is, is that part of the trick of uh, what is it? Yeah, even, even what seems to be beautiful in this world you know, has an opposite. So we'll call it beautiful and ugly. We might say that nature the trees, the mountains, the rivers, and so forth, the animals, and so forth, and then we have like dumps, city dumps, and landfills, and garbage piles, and so on and so forth. Uh, this is a world of opposites, and the opposites are part of the trick. So, at times, all we try to do as human beings is we try to give ourselves more experiences of, I'm the same way, I, I spent as much time as I could out in nature, 
but I, I, I enjoyed nature more than cities, more than civilization. I really felt to get away. I, I go off in hermitages. I lived in nature, lived with the bugs and grew food and lived close to the land and all this and this. And I did that as part of my journey. But there came a point where I started to realize that, that I wanted to be happy consistently and that if I was happy based on circumstances, like moving my body certain places or whatever, that it was always circumstance dependent. Like, even if you have a beautiful, if you're living in nature and the birds are chirping and you're out and, and you feel in harmony with everything, that if, if a person comes along or someone comes along and you feel you lose your peace, then I'm interested in how, how did I lose my peace? How, why could it be taken away so fast? Kirsten had a couple head injuries where she she felt so sensitized that when planes were even, she was living in one of the most beautiful countries like New Zealand, the South Island, where they shot Lord of the Rings <coughs> so, and it's just mystical and it looks, you know, it's just amazing down there. But when, when planes would even fly by, that the sound of the planes, you know, would be in fact, when I was in New Zealand, New Zealand's such a beautiful place, as the world judges it, that when I would go around and do these Course in Miracles gatherings, I would talk to the people and I would say, wow, this is kind of like an idyllic, like just like an ideal place on the planet to live. How are things going? And they said, well, we've got a big problem with, I was, I was waiting to see what, road rage. I said, road rage. Mm -hmm. You know, people on the road driving, getting really angry and smashing at other cars. <laughs> They're so, it's so great there in New Zealand that that's what their problems are, road rage. <laughs> the unconscious rage that's in the mind comes out in road rage. Not always, you don't hear that in a lot of places on the planet. They, it's projected onto many other things, but this was road rage. So, you do start to get a sense that, that there's something beyond the opposites and that you really want to discover that something. To, to be happy, or you know how they say beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Wouldn't it be great if you could reach a state of mind where everything was beautiful? Absolutely everything, without exception. Well, I, I know the feeling of, uh, I know, I mean, I know the truth about that, that, uh, that the beauty comes from the inside. I mean, uh, so, so I understand that um, heaven uh, didn't have to be a place. Yeah. But and then again, um, there's something I want to uh, get hold on because it's like. Say there really isn't a better place, but and the spirit works with you. Like if you're starting to feel this love for the planet or for Earth, we'll say the spirit works with that. The spirit's like, let's take that and let's grow that, let's expand that, let's have your heart just burst open in that love. Just like I said, like uh, I had a love for my biological family. I felt so much gratitude and so much appreciation for them and really it wasn't about pushing them away or letting them go or saying no you're not my family I've never gone to my biological family and say you are all pure illusions you know it's not it doesn't come that way at all it's more like the, the love just grows stronger and stronger and stronger as you go on this journey 
the spirit. It just goes absolutely unlimited is what it is. And and we had we're here now, but we actually started off here was it Friday night? Uh, Francis and I went to uh, give a talk at, at a church and I think it was when that was the night when you just I just looked over at Francis and she just said her eyes got all teary. And she couldn't speak. The, the love was so overwhelming. Some of you might were, were there. She just sat there and she just got tears in her eyes. And she, it was, she was speechless. The love was so strong. The, the love in her heart. And, and that's the way it goes. It's not, it's not like we have to figure out this illusion stuff. Um, it's more like you, you give yourself so fully over to this love. And that's what Kirsten loves so much about all these gatherings. She just loves showing up and telling people over and over and over how loved they are in one-on-ones and gatherings. You know, that's her life now. She just that's she just shows up. And, and that thing that Francis had, it was just the love just it just overtook her. It was so big that the words there was no words for it. So it's not, there really is nothing to figure out with any of this. We're just kind of tuning in. We're, we're attuning to the presence of love in a, in a much deeper way. Mm -hmm. And like I said, it's, it's really giving, like choosing for the spirit is the, is the only thing that you can really do. You know, even the question, like how do you see it as a dream? It's not, it's, it's just an experience that comes through a transformation from turning to the spirit more rather than to myself to, to know the answers. So with the turning to the spirit, you show me, you, know, you, you guide me, you just wanted to feel that connection more and more. The direction for our thinking and our focus is on an experience of a connection with the spirit rather than using the world as the reference. I want to go there because I, I'm responsible for handling something in the world. It's more of you notice that. Or I want to go there because I love going there, because I love nature. You know, it's, it's just, and it may be that you are to go there and be in nature, but it's just with, with each direction, or each day, each moment, it's, it's practicing with turning to the spirit. Is this where you would have me go? And so we're just, more and more the focus comes off the world and it gets softer. Like the focus on the world somehow gets softer and softer and softer and our dependence on it gets softer and softer. And the dependence is just the turning, turning to a different reference point. And the forgiveness is, is how the mind gets softened from the world too. Like each, each time you bring like a, a heartache or a grievance or some you know, experience to the spirit to release for forgiveness, the mind's grip on the world and who it thinks it, you know, who I think I am and what I think I've done is being softened as well. Mm -hmm. um, oh, but we are not the ego, so we are, we are the ego. We are spirit. We are spirit and, and to the extent that we identify with the body, yeah. The personality. That the ego. That's what the ego is, yeah. It, that's a, a misidentification. And the same thing. Thank you, Ocean. I had a, a time, one time back in uh, 2003, where I was on a trip and I, I hadn't really gone overseas at all. And, and I met this man named David who wanted me to go overseas and just start traveling all over the world. And I just, I said, oh, I, I have no time of that at all. And, and then he kept persisting, and he's uh, he won this big, all these air points, frequent flyer points, and I will fly you there, and, and himself and two friends, and all this stuff started to happen. And I do remember, I went down there, and I, I, I was in such joy to, to be just sharing and extending my heart down in Buenos Aires that I had to go to these 19 days, all these travels through taxi, and it was very hot, it was summertime, and the windows were down, and I remember one particular day, 
I was being driven to go share my heart at one of these gatherings. It was just exploding with love. I was just sitting in the front seat, having this wonderful connection with the cab driver. The car had no air conditioning, so the windows were rolled down. We're in a city of 15 and a half million people. And one of those big buses that come, you know, that have the side exhaust, not the top exhaust, it blows that black soot out of buses, not the top, but the side. It came over, and I was looking at the cab driver, and I was just in so much joy, and I remember, and then I turned, and all this black <laughs> soot from a bus came right up on my face, and I was just, I was just so happy. I, I just never, I just was, even with the black, polluted soot and the heat hitting my face, I just said, just, because just, it was all the same. The, the taxi driver, I was so happy to be there, I was shining my light, I was in my joy, I couldn't imagine anything else more happy. You know, just was, I was in it. It's not, it wasn't a nature experience, unless you consider the black <laughs> exhaust, but it was even, I just noticed how much joy I was in when the soot was hitting my face and the heat. And I thought, oh yeah, this is, this is what a miracle is. It, that, it's not circumstance dependent. That wouldn't have been a circumstance I would have believed to be joyful. But I wasn't, I wasn't circumstance dependent. The joy was just, was who I was. It's who everything was. It's, it was just, I was so grateful to be in purpose. And that's just, continued, you know, that just continued on and on. And I think that, that that's all we're saying is your heart just gets so bursting with love and gratitude and joy that the circumstances really don't have any influence at all. They just, they don't really matter. They don't matter at all. Yeah, it's like the purpose gets stronger and stronger and the purpose is, is love. It's the connection with the spirit. It comes through all of this forgiveness and mind training that that we're doing, and that purpose of just the spirit, the spirit, the spirit, yeah. relationship with God, that's the purpose, and that just becomes so, like your heart just gets so full of it, that everywhere you go, you, you just feel the spirit, you see reflections of the spirit, and that's where that, you know, the inner beauty or inner joy just ends up being all that you see everywhere that you go. But it's different to that, like, oh, I love something in the world, but it could go wrong. You know? It's, it, it's, it doesn't have the, the possibility of the rug being pulled out from underneath it, because it's just, it's the purpose. And in the end, that's what is the only thing where that can be consistent. The only thing that can be consistent. And that's why it's so precious, and why... Yeah, this gratitude just ends up being so full. It's, it's of God. <laughs> yeah, it's, it doesn't depend on the witnesses, but the witnesses are there. It reminds me, Jason told me this story one time that he was driving down through Cincinnati on the highway and he came across in the Kentucky and there was an automobile accident, some smash up of automobiles and actually he he was in such he was driving his car but he was feeling such joy and happiness and contentment and the state patrol officer uh, that was moving the out directing the traffic as Jason drove by the state patrol officer just gave him the biggest smile <laughs> and just waved and I had those kind of out of pattern experiences so many times where it's like there's a dream figure just going, isn't this wonderful? It's like he's directing traffic at a, at a car pile up. And he's like, like this. And I had a, another friend of mine, Lisa, who one day, she, she's so in the, she was so high, so miracle minded, that she was driving her car in this town in Pennsylvania. And she came to a stop at like a traffic light or something. And she was just, just in this high, high, high state of mind, the miracle state of mind. And all of a sudden, she heard what she thought was an explosion. Like, <coughs> like the building, the buildings around her sounded like they just And then she, she kept hearing a succession of explosions.
explosion and she was just in her car just looking and looking around as she's looking looking she she was just really high and it turns out that the buildings were not exploding the traffic lights were not exploding it was cars hitting her car <laughs> it was a pile up she was in the middle of a pile up of cars her car got the car crashed behind her but it came it all the way up and it put on the brakes but but it stopped right short of her car, so she, she didn't go flying or anything. It was just, then the car behind went boom, and then the next one went boom, and then the next one went boom. So there's like seven car pile up, and she's just <laughs> in the state of happiness. So she, she got to know Lisa, so she gets, <coughs> she still doesn't know what, she didn't realize that the cars had piled up until she got out, looking at the buildings, thinking the buildings were exploding. She looks back, and there's like six, seven cars piled up. She's like, looking. And she, she's still in the miraculous state. So people start to get out of their cars. And one lady comes up to her and is just like, distraught. And Lisa goes, it's her first thing out of her mouth, it's a miracle. <laughs> now she's just, it been a part of like a seven car pile up. And the first thing out of her mouth is, it's a miracle. To the person walking up. And the woman was like, was like staggered, <laughs> like, and then Lisa goes, no, it's really a miracle, this is a miracle, it's all God, it's all God. She's just in having this like, revelatory experience, and it's, it's a pile up, and this woman goes, and she, and Lisa goes, it's all our thoughts, it's all our thoughts, man, we're just doing this always, we're thinking all the time, it's just our thoughts, it's so wonderful, and the woman goes, you're right, <laughs> she said, I was just having this discussion with my husband five minutes ago, and I was saying to him, why can't I take the good car? Why do I have to drive this junky heap all the time? I don't want to be driving this heap. And this was the first weakness that, that Lisa got. And then the others got out, and then they all came, and there's so much giggling and laughter from all these people that got out of their cars. They were all swept up in the miracle, literally swept up. And here they are all laughing. Then the police show up. <laughs> and you've got to imagine how it looks when the police come <laughs> and see a seven car pileup and a bunch of people just laughing hilariously, hysterically. <laughs> the cops come and I'm like, what's going on here? <laughs> you see how out of pattern it is. But you see also how it's a, it's a state of mind. It's not. That's not circumstance dependent. That would not be the kind of circumstance that you would think would be a miracle. That's supposed to be like a tragedy. That's why they call them accidents. They, don't, they wouldn't say that that's just a, a quantum collection of thoughts <coughs> in which cars were supposed to be let go of, which is what, what it seemed to be playing out. So that's what we're saying, you know, it really, your mind is that powerful. You, your mind gives everything the meaning don't have to do that anymore. And it's still practical. I find everything in my life is practical. It's not like, it's not like we just go om, 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 and, or <laughs> meditate all day. We don't. If you follow us around, we, we're quite active. We're quite happy. Andy opened up his introduction saying, I've got the best job for that. <laughs> He's just part of it. Yeah, I, I just I said it a couple of other gatherings that the first time I saw David, what really convinced me to you know to give everything to this path isn't a metaphysics analysis of how we're in the dream that we're in the ego and to undo the ego. It's what he said in the gathering that I haven't had a bad day for twenty years. <laughs> to me, I was like, is that even possible? For human condition, you have good days and you have bad days, and you set up goals, and when you achieve your goals, you're happy, right? And that's that's the, the condition in my mind is like accepted that you have good and bad. It's a, accepted. There's nothing wrong with it. But what he was pointing to is a deeper calling that I have is can can that ever be that I have? Gonna, I'm going to be always happy. There's never going to be a bad day. There's never going to be a problem. There's never going to be upset. 
There's never going to be a suffering. There's never going to be any kind of ugliness or suffering that's even outside of me that's been perceived ever <coughs> possible. And he is basically just with such a confidence saying, it is possible and I'm doing it. And right now, what we're here to say is, it is possible, it's not necessarily just a theory in a book that you have to grasp as a concept and talk about this truth love and then all will be good. No, we just don't know what it takes. That's, that's really all this talk is about. Like to, to say that we want happiness, there is no doubt. That's our one desire for every, everyone. We just do not know what it takes. What it takes is the whole belief system that the world is built on, that we are questioning the whole thought system. And that is really what it takes to come back to this, our true nature as the spirit. And that's the only way we can be truly happy is to see who we truly are as the spirit. There is really no other way we can be happy. There is no other way that we can see beauty and be satisfied with it. The only way is what we're saying is this one solution to all problem is to realize we're the spirit. And I re remember when I first came to the monastery, I had such a difficulty in accepting this following the guidance thing. And I just keep talking the metaphysics of the course and saying that the spirit doesn't know this world. There's, it, it doesn't matter what you do in this world. Why do you have to follow guidance? It just doesn't make any sense to, to my mind. And I, I do not know how to follow something I don't even understand because, and then Jason, I remember we were just having a, a discussion and he just was telling me something that he, in his experience, and I just keeps up asking, so what, then what? If I keep following, then what, so what? And then in the end he said, after many, many of my questions, he said, then you realize you are the spirit not someone else guiding you. In the end, the experience is going to be you are the spirit. And I thought, okay. That's, that's, a, good, that's a good answer that I can give it a try. If that's, in the end, I, don't, I still don't feel that I can be happy if there is an outside power that, that knows it all and that's guiding me and I'm this small thing that I need to find the answer. But that is actually the experience that I, after all these years, and I can just say it is the experience, and that's the only experience that can bring us happiness, is to completely identify with the spirit ourselves. And it is possible, it is just very, very practical as well. We just do not hide anything and protect anything in our thoughts, let it all come up and keep just following the, the practical steps. In every following, this part of the mind is washed clean. And in the end, this is the goal. It's not intellectual understanding about the course at all. Yeah, you actually have to forget the course. It, it kind of, Jesus comes right out that and says that in his Perfect Lesson 189. Forget this world, forget this course. So isn't that beautiful too? Don't you love that? A teaching, it's almost like a self-destructing teaching <laughs> that, you know, like, like that Mission Impossible thing, if you choose to do it, and then the tape just goes up and, so this, we're not dependent on the book. It's not a book that's telling us to be dependent on a book. It's telling us that our use for words is almost over as we go through it. Isn't that wonderful that it's not saying it's the only pathway to God, it's just saying it's one among many, and then it's saying, forget this now too. Forget, forget your theology. You have to let go of your theology. And so if I show up and words seem to come, and words come from any of us, if they're just coming from joy, you know, it's, I don't select these words. I don't know what words are coming. It's coming from a state of mind where it's beyond the words. And we don't have to be dependent.